This general rule, the receipt rule, applies to all forms of instantaneous communication. Telephone, telex, fax, even orally speaking with someone face to face, that's instantaneous. But of course, the audio waves, the sound waves that exit your mouth or the offeree's mouth, they have to reach the ears of the offeror. And as soon as they do, the contract is formed. So the receipt rule means the message must reach the offeror in any case. And of course, we already know this from Entores. And in Bryn Kibon and Stag Star, very much the same facts or very similar facts happened again, where a UK company had a contract with a foreign company. This time, the company was based in Vienna and Austria. And the question arose as to jurisdiction. And that question can only be determined by figuring out where was the contract formed. And in order to figure that out, we have to look once again at the point in time when acceptance was received. And acceptance in this case was received, unfortunately, for the UK company in Austria. And hence, because the message, the acceptance, had received, been received in Austria, the jurisdiction was held to be in Austria. Now, importantly, in Brinkibon, the judges said this. The message may not reach or be intended to reach the designated recipient immediately. Messages may be sent out of office hours or at night with the intention or on the assumption that they will be read at a later time. There may be some error or default at the recipient's end which prevents receipt at the time contemplated and believed in by the sender. The message may have been sent and or received through machines operated by third persons and many other variants may occur. No universal rule can cover all such cases. They must be resolved by reference to the intentions of the parties, by sound business practice, and in some cases, by judgment where the risks should lie. Now, that brings us to something else, something new, which we'll move on to in a moment, which is sometimes the receipt rule does not apply. But for now, as a general proposition, unless there's another rule, we apply the receipt rule. So unless there's some other rule that we know to apply, we ask ourselves at what point in time and where is the acceptance received by the offeror? And at that very moment in time where and when it is received, that is the place and the time at which the contract is formed. There is one big exception to the receipt rule, and it's something we call the postal rule. The postal rule arose from a case that was called Adam and Linzel. What happened in this case is that goods were offered for sale and the offeree accepted by way of post. So the acceptance was sent by post. In the meantime, while the letter was in transit within the postal system, the goods were sold to someone else. Thus the question arose whether the initial contract was formed at some point before the acceptance was received. That means before the letter that had been sent through the post had been received by the offeror. And according to the receipt rule, we'd have to say, well, the contract is only formed once the offeror receives that letter. And so this is the exception. Where you communicate by post, the receipt rule does not apply. Instead, the postal rule applies. And that means that the offer is accepted by way of posting a letter. And as soon as you drop that letter into the post box, or as soon as you hand it over to the post office, the contract is formed at that point in time. So we do not have to wait until the letter is actually received by the offeror. The acceptance is valid and the contract is complete at the time of posting. And by the way, the same rule, the postal rule, applies to courier services or telegrams, for instance. What sets all these apart from the instantaneous forms of communication that we already talked about? Well, what sets them apart is that in all these cases, what you're actually doing when you post your acceptance or hand it over to the courier service is you are passing control of your letter, of your message, of that data. You're passing control of it 
to a third party, neither the offeror nor the offeree. And of course, once that happens, the risk is that the third party may lose that information. Now, the third party, in the case of the post office, we assume they're going to deliver the letter at some point and everything will be fine, but that doesn't always happen. Or as in Adam and Linzel, sometimes things may happen while a letter is in transit. So the courts have to basically assign the risk. Does the risk of the letter being lost lie with the offeror or with the offeree? And the court determined it should be the offeror. So the general rule in regards to communication that goes through third parties where you hand the information over to a third party, such as a courier service or the post office, is that the offeror takes the risk. That means the offeror is responsible for the risk of that letter being lost because the letter is deemed to, as long as it incorporates acceptance, is deemed to be effective and acceptance is effective at the point in time at which the letter is posted. And the same question came up again in household fire and carriage accident insurance. Now in this case, unlike in Adam and Linzel where the, another transaction took place while the letter was in transit, in household fire and carriage accident insurance, the letter was actually lost. It was lost altogether. And the court reaffirmed that in those cases, once again, the offer rule assumes that risk and the contract is formed before the offer rule receives the letter. So it is formed at the point in time when the letter is posted. Now, one important point to note is that the postal rule only applies to communication of acceptance. It does not apply to communication, for instance, of revocation. If you want to revoke your offer, you actually have to inform the other party. The other party has to receive your update. They have to receive your revocation. So by simply posting your revocation in the mail and just saying that, well, as soon as you dropped it off at the post office, the revocation was valid, that's not good enough. So that rule only applies to acceptance. In Bern and Fantino, something exactly like that happened. The offeror had sent off the offer by post. A couple of days later, they sent off a revocation, revoking the initial offer, again by post. Now, because post takes a while, the first letter, of course, reached the offeree first. The offeree, once they got the first letter, immediately accepted by a form of instantaneous communication. Now, the question arose as to whether the contract was formed at that point in time, and the court said, yes, it was, because even though the revocation at the time that the acceptance was communicated was still in transit, it had not reached the offeree. So the original offer was never revoked at the point in time when the acceptance was communicated. Now, what about email? This is, of course, a much more recent question, but it is a very important one. A lot of contracts happen online, and not only by email, but for instance, by going to a website and buying a book from Amazon, for instance, and pressing I agree at the end of that process. At what point in time do you communicate your acceptance in order for it to form a contract? Now, if we apply the postal rule, it would basically mean that as soon as you press the button, whether it's send or whether it's I agree on, on the Amazon website, immediately at that point in time, the contract would have been formed according to the postal rule. According to the receipt rule, the contract would only be formed once your message, your email or your message via a website reaches the other side. So basically once it shows up on their terminals, on their computers, on the other side. Now, how does the law deal with this? Well, in fact, the answer is probably somewhere in the middle. The rule is, and we can refer to the Electronic Transactions Acts, which you find throughout the Caribbean. Sometimes they have slightly different names. However, in most cases, they would be called Electronic Transactions Acts, but they contain more or less the same rules no matter where you go. And the basic rule is receipt occurs when the electronic record enters an information processing system of the addressee. So you note here, it doesn't necessarily have to reach the addressee. It doesn't have to reach, say, their computer or their computer screens or 
It doesn't have to be opened by them if it's email. It doesn't have to be the point in time at which they open their email. In fact, it's not. It's the point in time when it reaches their data processing system. So again, the answer is somewhere in between, but I think the postal rule explains it quite well. The postal rule, recall, means or is founded on the idea that once you give your information, your letter, to a third party, you are no longer in control of it. Therefore, the postal rule is different from the receipt rule. And by email or by internet, communicating by those means is fairly similar because when you press send, you are passing your information to another party, but you would have chosen that party. You chose who your internet supplier is. You chose, for instance, what email service to use. So by extension, you could argue that you are still in control of that or you had some say in that. However, once your internet server and once your email provider, whichever, handles that information, processes it, and then passes it along the, the chain to the other side server, at the point in time when it reaches the other side server, which again is before it reaches the other side, is before it reaches the other party, before it reaches their computer before they open their emails but as soon as it reaches their information processing system that is the point in time when acceptance is deemed to have been communicated and the contract comes about the contract is formed at that point in time so lastly let us briefly summarize what we now know about acceptance number one acceptance must be final and unqualified so there can be no variation between the offer and the acceptance. So a good test for that is to ask yourselves, did the offeree say something or communicate something to the effect of, I agree, I accept, with no additions, no variations, no modifications. Acceptance also has to be communicated. And silence can never be communication. So. It has to be communicated either in writing or orally or by conduct, but not by mere silence. And then in terms of when the contract is actually formed, we basically have two rules. We have the receipt rule, which applies to all forms of instantaneous communication, excluding email and internet communication. And what the receipt rule basically says is once the information is received by the offer or by the other party, that is the point in time when the contract is formed. And the exception to this is the postal rule. That means when you pass the information, the acceptance in the form of a letter, for instance, to the post office or a courier service, then acceptance is deemed to have been communicated at the point in time at which you hand over the letter to the post office or put it in the post box. And so the contract comes into being at that point in time. And then lastly, we briefly talked about emails which is sort of a mixture between the postal rule and the receipt rule. The rule being that once the information, the data reaches the other side's information processing system, that is the point in time when the contract comes into being. Thanks very much for your attention.